May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was going back to uh, an article that I'd seen years ago, and it's of responses that kids in England were giving to the question, what did the Magi bring Jesus as gifts? And uh, here's three of them that I thought were really funny. Uh, they all have the similar theme. Uh, one of them, uh, this is a seven-year-old, said, uh, they brought him incense and myrrh, but I think he would have really wanted a blanket. <laughs> Another one said something similar, uh, uh, incense and myrrh uh, and gold, but uh, I would have given him Legos. And um, uh, my last one uh, that I think is my favorite said, they brought him uh, in gold, incense, and myrrh. Um, that's it, no toys. I feel really sorry for Jesus. So all of these are just responses to the Christmas story. And, and it's interesting because when we think of the Christmas story, when we read the story, we focus a lot on the responses in the gospel narrative. We have the response of the shepherds, the response of the magi. And, uh, and you read all of the wonderful words that are associated like homage, giving of gifts, good news, peace for all people. Uh, wonderful responses that seem to talk about Jesus, the gift of the Messiah, uh, as a gift, that, that the Messiah was a gift. But what I want to talk about today is the part of the story that Ethan just read for us, which is a different experience of the Messiah, and that is the Messiah as a threat. So you have the Messiah as a gift, but you also have the Messiah as a threat. And this is epitomized in the person of Herod, a king who was extremely threatened by Jesus and the notion that this child would someday replace him. So he didn't really do the math on his age and the age of the child and how old the, the child would be before he's replaced. Uh, but his response to this was to try to eliminate the threat. Now, this is a king who didn't spare some of his own children when he felt like they were also going to contend for the throne. So he's really, really um, uh, feeling protective of power and his status and his position that he tried to eliminate the child. So there was something that he held to be really valuable. We're talking about, in this case, power and control for him, but kind of broader, and I would just use general terms, that he was experiencing a threat towards something that he felt and held to be valuable that he couldn't imagine his life without, something that defined him. Uh, this is where he placed his sense of identity. This is what he knew. Uh, this is where he found safety, belonging, comfort, maybe even meaning in life. Uh, so this position that he was in, and it felt threatened, and his response was to eliminate the threat. So unlike the Magi and the shepherds who saw the Messiah as coming to give something, Herod saw the Messiah as someone who came to take something away. I think this is a really, really beautiful distinction when you look at the rest of Jesus's life and ministry, that there were two types of responses and reactions to Jesus. Uh, you had uh, people who believed that Jesus was coming to give, and there were others who saw Jesus as someone who was coming to take. So to give, giving good news, giving hope, to give sight, to the blind, to give and bring liberation, to give spiritual tools or access to the deeper things in life. That's one demographic, one response to the Messiah. And the other response, like Herod, and we see this throughout Jesus's ministry, was the, the belief that this person, Jesus, came to take. So to take a sense of stability away, uh, to alter the status quo, to dismantle what was valued, uh, to threaten certain privileges. And what's interesting is that there seems to be a defining line here, 
a defining line when you look at the story of who tended to see Jesus as someone who came to give and who tended to see Jesus as someone who was taking, as a threat. Uh, the haves, those who has had money, uh, dignity, status, power, rights, comfort, who had access, uh, those tend to reject Jesus as an agent of change because those things are very comfortable and, and, and change when it comes to these things um, was seen as a negative. Uh, whereas those who were the have-nots, uh, they tended to welcome the Jesus as the change agent. And this is the delineating line. Now, before I go any further in this sermon, I want to say today we're going to do something um, I, that I'm looking forward to. There's not an adult forum planned for today. Instead, I'm going to invite anyone who wants to stay uh, in the service following the beautiful prelude that Carl will play just for a sermon discussion because I, I really would value interacting with you as a community on the sermon. So as many of you as want to stay are welcome to, and we'll use the chat box, and we'll, we'll, I'll just call on you, and we'll um, hear your thoughts on this and go a little bit deeper into this message. So those who saw Jesus as a coming to give and those who saw Jesus as coming to take, um, the gift and the threat. Now, what I think is really interesting is that sometimes we might find ourselves inclined to uh, see uh, certain people as one falling into one of these categories and others as falling into other categories. But today what I want to do is talk about both of these responses to the Messiah actually living within each of us. So there are parts of our lives where we, we welcome the change agent. We welcome the Messiah. And there are other parts of our lives where we feel threatened and we, we don't want to welcome it. And, and let me just kind of uh, expand a little bit on this idea of Jesus as a threat. How does Jesus threaten us? Jesus brings a gospel, if you look at the general teachings and the mission of Jesus, he brings a, a gospel of radical generosity, both emotional and material. And this can be a threat. Radical emotional generosity. Love your enemy. Always forgive. Be merciful. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Do good to those who hate you. It's just, if you really are thinking about what that, the implications of that are, you're probably feeling a little bit of the threatening message of Jesus. Or Jesus talks about radical material generosity. Give and do not expect anything in return. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger. Jesus talks about a gospel of people, not things. He talks about a gospel of downward mobility. Seek to serve and not to be served. And so these ways that tend to threaten us, what I think that we, we do as Christians, and, and I, I look forward to your thoughts on this, is that the temptation is to uh, create a scenario where we're willing to receive the God who gives, but when we experience God as the God who threatens, we actually sideline that God. So, so we're comfortable with the God who gives, who gives comfort, who gives hope, who gives good news in those times where we're broken or in need or really needing that spiritual replenishing. But when it comes to the God who threatens, we sideline that God. So we, in some ways, create a one-sided God in our lives. Uh, and, and, and today, going back to this idea that the Messiah in the Gospels is a Messiah who both gives and a Messiah who takes. A Messiah who, who gives gifts, who is a gift giver and a Messiah who is a threat. Uh, and, and I want to lean into this a little bit more and say that these two are not mutually exclusive. So that the God who threatens, that the threat is actually the access point to the gift. I heard a quote recently, I was... Um, uh, part of a workshop online, and the speaker said that you should thank your enemies. Listen to this. Thank your enemies 
for giving you an opportunity to grow. I was like, wow, um, what a crazy notion to go to somebody who makes you super uncomfortable, someone you just wanna eliminate from the picture, uh, but, but to thank them for the opportunity to help you grow. Now, uh, years ago, someone, sh now I think I've known you guys enough, long enough to be able to say this. So please forgive me if this is super offensive, um, but I, I, after 11 years, feel comfortable enough sharing this with you. But one of my lenses for life is something someone shared with me uh, years ago, and it's, an, it's the acronym AFGO. I won't say the word here, but it's another effing growth opportunity. AFGO. And it's this opportunity to look at life and say, wow, that's another growth opportunity, but recognizing that it's super uncomfortable. And I can't tell you the number of times, and I, I think that you would probably agree with me, the number of times it actually feels like that, doesn't it? Another expletive growth opportunity. Um, and, and when I think of this, when I think of this kind of lens of looking at the uncomfortable and the threat and saying, all right, here it comes again, it actually shifts things for me. And, and I, I take that hand in hand with another concept. I'm just sharing with you these kind of tools that work for me is a, a Buddhist concept of strong back, soft front. I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with this, but the idea of a strong back. So someone with boundaries, someone who knows how to stand their ground, but is not someone who is also super um, um, inflexible. So have, has a soft front. So you're able to receive what comes, but you don't buckle under the pressure. You're able to um, receive the discomfort, but also you know where to draw boundaries. So it's this idea of remaining soft toward adversity and uh, toward the uncomfortable in life. And this is my message today, is the power of actually seeing the threat as the access point to the gift. And I think that this is the true the, true, uh, the truth about real growth and maturity in our lives, that if you look at your life, you'll see that the parts in life where you've grown the most are the parts where you had to deal with the threat. And it wasn't the parts that just felt swimmingly, went swimmingly and were comfortable. So I wanna end the sermon today with a question. And I, again, look forward to interacting with you on this. The question is this, as you think of 2021, what do you really want? What do you really want for this year? I'm not talking about the specifics. I'm talking about the overarching goals for yourself as a person, as a human. If your goal, if your desire is to grow and to mature and to um, become more awake and alive, if that's your desire. Then I invite you today, as we begin this year, to seek uh, to welcome, to seek to welcome and embrace that which threatens to expand you beyond the confines of your smaller self. Amen.